Evelyn to Philip, January 29, 1945. My dearest Phil, this is the first letter I have written to you since Friday night, January 26. I feel very guilty about not writing all that time, and I'm very sure you'll understand why once I proceed to explain. In fact, I believe this will be a long, long, longy, because I have plenty to say to make up for the time I didn't write. After writing to you on Friday, I hit the hay, only to experience a sleepless night. I guess all the excitement of the evening took its toll on me, for I was sicker than a dog. I found it difficult to breathe, and I felt so nauseous that I found it difficult to lie down for even a minute for fear that I would throw up. My tummy felt queer and sort of nervous. I was glad when the dawn appeared and I could dress and go downstairs. I couldn't touch any food whatever and settled for a nice big cup of hot tea and lemon, which set me straight almost immediately, except for some gnawing pains in the stomach. Mr. Bellet and my dad called for me at 8, as usual, on Saturday morning, and I went along. Adele had chosen to sleep till the last minute, so I just had time to get her dressed, and my mother stayed here to feed her before taking her over to 4920. I worked my usual five hours and received a pay of $27.42 after the deductions of a dollar and a dollar eight were made. I put in 38 hours last week. Eddie and Ruth were to meet us at the place at 1.30, as we had all previously arranged to spend the afternoon in town, eating lunch, seeing a show, etc. I was kind of leery about whether or not I could go along, but by the time they showed up, I was feeling pretty chipper. We had lunch at H&H &H after Mr. Bellet had chatted with Ed a short while. My lunch consisted of creamed potatoes, a chicken croquette, and more tea with lemon. I felt lots better after lunch. We decided to go to the Earl. On the way over, one of those street photographers made some pictures of Ruth and Ed. I was going to get in, but didn't think I looked too well for taking pictures. The show at the Earl was grand. It consisted of a Class B picture called Johnny Doesn't Live Here Anymore with Simone Simone and James Ellison, which deals with the rooming situation in Washington. For a Class B, it was pretty good, and I laughed at some of the really funny scenes. The stage show consisted of Tony Pastor and company and James Barton. The music, clowning, and dancing were all lively and entertaining, and the whole show was by far the best I had seen in many a month. It did me a world of good. My dad, Ed, and Ruth enjoyed it as much as I did. We headed straight home after the show, as I had promised my mother we would be home about seven so that she could get finished with supper and Adele. I had called the house to learn that there were two letters from Jack N. from me. When we got home, I stopped here to pick up my mail and went over to my mother's for dinner. One of the envelopes contained a $17 money order from Jack for the pin, which I told you I wanted to return. The other was a nice letter, and he promised to come to see me soon. In the midst of dinner, which was quite a light one for me, with a large bowl of hot tea and a shot of whiskey to put on the finishing touches, the phone rang and I heard a male voice say to Ed, don't tell her who it is. It was Jack N. and he was here at 4906. I dressed Adele and came right over. Jack ate dinner with the folks as I had had mine and I put Adele to bed and did whatever else necessary while they ate. Adele was friendly with Uncle Shock. 
Adele pronounces Jack as a Frenchie would, and undoubtedly he will write all about the visit in his next letter. Goldie and Harry were going to the movies that evening and asked if we cared to go along, but we didn't. Instead, we stayed in, read over several of your letters, talked about many things with Mom, and about 11 o'clock we both went to see Faye, whom I had promised to see that night. Jack and I stayed till 12 and came home. We all had tea or milk and cake and hit the hay. When I got upstairs, it was 2 o'clock, and someone rang the bell. It developed that Ed was out with his girlfriend Ruth and had forgotten his key. So I told him to come in and go right to sleep with Jackie, which he did. I got up early Sunday morning, and by the time I finished with Adele and straightened up, it was time for breakfast. Ed stayed for that, too, and stayed for dinner in the evening besides. By the time we all had breakfast, it was time to give Adele lunch and get her to bed for her nap. Ruth came over, page two, and she, Jack, and I dragged out our album of pictures and went through it. In the meantime, in walked the brownies with Sylvia. Before they left, we took some snaps. As it just happened that Sid had a camera and film, which was more than I could manage to obtain anywhere. We took one snap of Adele alone, one of Jack, Adele, and me, and one of all the Browns, Adele, Ruth, and myself. I hope they turn out, for they are the first snaps I've taken in weeks, or is it months? Adele still has had tiny traces of a cold, which is due mostly to the cutting of her two-year molars. It is this mainly that has kept me from calling in a photographer, as I want her to look as well as feel good when I have her picture made. By the time the brownies left, it was time for dinner. I gave Adele hers, and then we ate. It was decided that Jack, Ed, Ruth, Ed's girl, and I would go out together. I was dying to see Mrs. Parkington, which was playing at the Rockland, and which Ed and Ruth had seen that very afternoon. We let them go to the Logan to see something else, and we saw Mrs. P. Phil, don't miss it. I think it is an excellent picture, and I enjoyed it thoroughly. I wore my lemon-colored dress with red beads, and Jack thought it was a snazzy outfit. We met Ed and Ruth after the show and went to Snyder's, where we all had double-decker sandwiches and malteds. Ed took Ruth home, and Jack and I got right home and right to bed, as it was almost two and Jack had to make an eight o'clock train. I gave him the alarm clock, but eight o'clock this morning I woke him myself. Evidently he hadn't heard the alarm go off. By the time he got dressed and I made him breakfast, he just had time to dash out of here to make a ten o'clock train. I felt pretty good considering that I hadn't had any real sleep for almost three nights. As soon as I was ready, I took Adele over to my mother's and went to work. I was so darn busy all day at work that I didn't have time to eat the sandwich I had brought along, nor did I feel like eating. I settled for an apple and some peanut butter crackers, which Ann brings along daily from their grocery store. Goldie called me during the course of the day to tell me that there were two letters from you, darling. It was good to get home this evening and find your long letter of 14 January and V-mail of 18 January waiting for me. My dearest one, I love you so much. Your letter of 14th was very lovely and replied to a great extent to the letters I had written during the month of December. I'm particularly glad that I returned the pin now that you gave with what I would with what was a very pleasant surprise for me. So you're having something made for me. I can't help wondering what it is, and I shall be anxiously awaiting its arrival. 
I sure do wish I could count on your coming along with it, sweet. You may be right about the GI loan, but I still feel that it wouldn't hurt one little bit to get off to a good start of our own. I'd much rather not borrow, and the less we do have to, the better. But we shall see one day. As for settling in Massachusetts, well, baby, any place you are is good enough for me, if it's what you want. Adele's walking continues to improve, and I make fun of it often to call it to her attention. She'll get out of it, baby, so don't worry about it. By the way, it is 1 a.m. After having dinner and bathing, Adele, I was so exhausted that I lay down for a minute. That turned into three hours. Now that I had a nap, I feel refreshed and decided to get on with this so I could get it posted first thing in the morning. As you may have noted, sweet, I spoke in a very general way of what I did this past weekend. Incidentally, baby, please try to get your hands on a 1945 February Reader's Digest. There is an article called, And the Deaf Shall Hear, which deals entirely with Jack's operation and the ear specialist who performed the operation, Dr. Julius Lempert. Jack has what is known as osteosclerosis, and this article explains it fully. I know you'll find it very interesting. If you can't get a digest, let me know and I'll send one right along. By the way, I never did get off the package to you. However, Ed has promised to pack and mail it for me tomorrow or the next day, providing I get a carton and the paper and twine. I ready two small cartons at work, but neglected to bring them home. I'll definitely bring them tomorrow so that I can get the package off. The delay annoys me, as I know you need the shoes. Ed brought no less than eight overseas packages home with him, and since he refuses to touch any kind of sweets whatever, he is letting me take whatever I want to complete the packages I have for you. Ed's skin broke out badly, and he is trying to clear it by staying away from sweets. Ed told me to tell you that he intends to write, page 3, you a 20-page letter telling you in detail all that's happened to him since he last saw you. It may take him a few days to get around to it, but he told me to tell you to expect it, so I'm obeying orders. Ed looks fine, but really, Phil, he has changed completely. He's very matured and more nervous than I ever remember him. He had a funny, faraway look in his eyes sometimes and had to force himself to think very clearly about what he has to say before he says it. It's easy to see that he's been through a lot, though he may have put it on thickly, he is far from being normal. It's such a thrill to him not to have to take orders and be his own boss. As Jack said, I hope it's the start of better things to come. And now to Jack. His hearing is much better than what it was when I was in New York. He's looking much better now that he has regained some of the weight he lost after the operation. His hearing is still not better than it was previous to the operation, but it is almost on a par, and he's hoping for better things every day. I just noted that I used better three times, and since I'm tripling, to coin a word if I may, I think I'll get to bed and continue this in the morning. January 30th, 1945. Good morning, baby. Here I am again. Only I'm really rested this time, and my mind is clear. I was so exhausted yesterday that the whole day seems like a dream. I won't have time to continue on this now, honey, so I shall close now and write another letter later. Anne, the bookkeeper, used to work for a beauty concern and got me some Revlon lipstick wholesale. 
A dollar twenty-two cost me seventy-two cents. It's called Rosie Future, and I'm sending some along and hope that the smell holds. I adore you, Angel, and now I must rush if I'm to get to work at all. A big kiss, your Ev. Philip to Evelyn, 29 January 1945. My darling, took it easy all day today. I slept in till lunchtime when I rose, dressed, washed, and walked down to the mess hall. Snow and ice are everywhere, and I had a couple of near falls on the way. Stopped in at the Aero Club on the way back and read today's good news in the British newspapers. There is a great big fireplace in the lounge of the club, and I spent a pleasant few hours there. The Russian drive seems irresistible, and one wonders what the Nazis can possibly now do now to check it. The tremendous weight of men and guns the Reds are throwing into the battle must far surpass anything the Germans have, or had for that matter. There are signs, too, that the armies in the West under General Eisenhower are going to cut loose soon. The bulge has been eradicated, and it's just a question of building up before the final plunge, which anyone can plainly see will spell fini for the Nazis. I'm so sure that this will happen in the very near future, say within a month or two, that I am asking myself, what then? Well, Chippy, we may be very sure that one of two things will happen to me once the European conflict ends. One, I will be shipped home. Two, I will be shipped to the Pacific Theater. Of the two, I am inclined to think that the former will be the case, but of course I can't be sure. In any case, whatever happens, I know now I can count on you to keep your chin up so I can face any prospect with at least a semblance of equanimity. Tonight I will be busy sewing. Yes, I said sewing. Don't laugh, Chippy. You'd be surprised what I can do when I'm forced into it, and I have been forced into it. Seems like we have to have all our 8th Air Force patches, chevrons, Hershey bars, ribbons, etc. on our clothes, and I have quite a bit of stitching to do. There was still no mail today, and I can't think of another solitary thing to say. A couple of the fellows want me to play some pinochle now, honey, so I'll sign off for the time being with all my love to you and the pumpkin and all the family. Forever, your Phil.